So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on. Uh, we are moving on to the next presentation on significance of multiple micronutrient supplements in improving maternal and child health in Nigeria. Uh, and to lead this process, I want to invite uh, my teacher and mentor, Professor Sunday Oladapo Shitu, to guide us on the next steps. Thank you, sir. Let me handle that. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, please permit me to uh, welcome you to this very uh, special and illuminating session. Uh, please mind each of these words I have used because uh, by the time we conclude this session uh, I'm sure you'll be convinced that those words were appropriate. Uh, before we start uh, I, want you, I want to crave your indulgence to invite uh, the key speakers for this session. Uh, May I invite uh, Dr. Meru Mandara, please? <laughs> Dr. El Haji Isaka Diop, please. And uh, my special friend and also vice chancellor of uh, pra i mean premier pioneer vice chancellor of the university of federal no not sorry let me get take it again federal university of health sciences azari uh, no other than professor bala Please, please join me here on the high table. Please, may I have the light? Light. Um, I will be introducing the speakers just before they come to the podium. Um, but first, let me just uh, wel formally welcome us to this session. Uh, it's titled Multiple Micronutrient Supplementation. Uh, once again, I want to congratulate all of us for the judgment to come and participate in this session. Uh, later on, you'll come to see why I congratulate you. Um, you see, for many years, we obstetricians, our attention has been diverted to be focusing mainly on emergency issues, whether in gynecology and obstetrics. And I'm glad that we are now waking up to um, responding more strongly to the preventive arm of our professional practice. Recently, there was a survey, I don't know how many of us saw it in the National Demographic Health Survey, 2018 that revealed that about 61% of Nigerian women, reproductive age, 
have anemia. What more? Fifty seven percent were non pregnant. Sorry, anemia was fifty seven percent in the non pregnant, sixty one percent in the pregnant, and sixty percent in the breastfeeding population. As obstetricians, all of us know the significance of that statistics. And these are Nigerian women whose health and well-being are in our custody. But the question I ask is, are we surprised at these statistics? Because if you go around the country, you find that um, in the north, most of our women thrive on what? They survive on Masara maize and various products that derive from it. If you go to the middle belt, it is cassava. And if you go to the southern part of the country, it is yam and related stuff. How much micronutrient do we get from this? And that same uh, publication highlighted the relative prevalences of anemia across this country. I was shocked to find that the highest prevalence was in the southeast zone of this country, followed by south-south, followed by northwest, and so on. Distinguished colleagues, we need to change this narrative. Are we surprised that Nigeria still has what? One of the highest burden of maternal mortality, still birth rate, and what? Newborn or perinatal mortality. Meanwhile, we are signatories to what? Attaining health for all by the year what? 2030, which is just short of seven years ahead. So we need to change this paradigm. And uh, we need to heighten our investment in preventive arm, our preventive response in obstetrics and gynecology. Malnutrition, somebody said, described malnutrition as what? Hidden hunger. Permit me to quote it. He said malnutrition is what? Hidden hunger. That it develops gradually and by the time it is evident and detected, it is no longer reversible. Did you hear me? That's a serious thing, which means the time to intervene on my, my nutrition is what? In its prevention. Because by the time you see it with short stature or uh, low birth weight babies, you can't reverse it anymore. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you now see why I congratulate you for participating in this session. Because here, assembled, we have a cream of experts who will be treating us to how we should prevent malnutrition, how we should square out with this anemia that is highly prevalent in our country and which is causing untold hardship, morbidity, and mortality to our women. And uh, so, I think to kickstart the presentation, uh, I want to invite a prominent member of Sogon, who has also made us proud by her own right, she has been uh, a consultant in National Hospital, Abuja. She has worked at the international level as the current uh, director of uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And more recently, she served as special advisor on health 
to the executive governor of Borno State. She still remained one of us at heart and also in practice. And she's going to take us through uh, an, an illuminating session on multiple micronutrient supplementation. What it is, how we need it. Please join me to invite Dr. Mero Mandara. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues, uh, and thank you very much for joining us in this uh, very important session and has been uh, described by my teacher, Professor Shitu, and I always say my teacher because I did obstetrics and gynecology from day one of residency till I got part two under him. So he's truly my teacher. So thank you. Uh, very much and and he also happens to be my doctor actually and delivered most of my children so <laughs> so thank you very much for not just being my teacher but uh, a practical obstetrician in my life uh, this morning we're going to be discussing a very important issue of multiple micronutrient supplementation for pregnant women as for a very important reason one of the most important reasons is that globally everywhere in the world it has been established that what we know is really true, that most women go into pregnancy with anemia, which is what we've been taught and which we have been practicing forever. But what we also know as of today is that most women also go into pregnancy with multiple multinutrients deficiencies, multivitamins deficiencies, deficiencies in minerals that are essential not just for the woman, but also for the baby, most importantly for the brain development of the baby and other things. So why is it that today when the whole world is addressing the issues from the root, we still stuck at iron and folic acid? Uh, as uh, Professor Shito has said, good nutrition is important and especially for pregnant women because as we all know, the energy, the use of all resources in human beings increase in pregnancy and an increase of over 300 calories happen per day just simply because a woman is pregnant. Now in low and middle income countries and indeed with global economic recession, most women pre-pregnancy have not only deficiencies in iron and folate but also vitamins A, C, D, E, B1, B2, B3, B6, B12 and folic acid and also minerals, iron, zinc, iodine, copper, and selenium. And I think for those of us from Maiduguri, including uh, calcium, because that's also a huge issue now in Maiduguri. And increasingly, you find that if you pay attention, different parts of the country have different issues in addition to these basic standard ones that we all know about. And we all know, we've learned from, pre uh, from, uh, from clinical practice and from medical school that um, malnutrition or inadequate nutrition leads to low birth weight, preterm delivery, being born small for gestational age, and a host of other outcomes uh, for the mother and the baby. Uh, what we also know is that malnourished women with severe anemia are two times are likely to die during or shortly after childbirth. Uh, micronutrients deficiency can have lifelong impact on a child's physical, mental, and emotional development. And we also know that the impact uh, that the impact of malnutrition in childhood at the beginning of life can linger till age 30 years. So if one, especially a female child, has had malnutrition from childhood, first of all, you grow stunted. And so therefore, you become a likely candidate for things like cephalopelvic disproportion and a host of other things. So if you like malnutrition, it's one thing, one condition that gives you a roller coaster effect in life. Of course, short-statured uh, uh, brain development, 
uh, micronutrient deficiency, fatigue, impaired productivity, and school performance. Increasingly, uh, school performance of children is highly associated with the food they eat. And that's why the federal government has started the school feeding, not only to increase enrollment, but to increase attention in class. And once you do not have attention early stage, it becomes a lingering thing that affects you for the rest uh, of your life. And of course, things we know uh, from medical school, short statue associated with prolonged labor, uh, 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 things around eclampsia, and um, of course, increased maternal mortality. And the child also has severe, severe, severe impact. We, a lot of times in antenatal care, focus on the mother, maternal anemia, maternal anemia, maternal anemia. But what about the fetus? Not only is the anemia affecting it, but also the issues of multivitamins and minerals that are lacking in the child that affect not only the child as a neonate, but the performance of the child up to adulthood. And no wonder you find where mothers feed well, where babies are fed well, and, and you get the Einsteins and so on. And when you have uh, the opposite, we get what, what, what we get. Sometimes I wonder, is it responsible for some of our thugs? Is it something that they acquired prenatally because their were, mothers were not well fed? Are these part of the consequences of social inequity in society that we're suffering from and we can't uh, kind of move around uh, as a country, uh, as, as a people within the country? But significantly, more than anything, it does affect the girl and the woman more than anybody else. Not only because women grow up to also carry the parasite of, in the form of a fetus, but also that in the socioeconomic milieu that we live in, women have lower chances of financial independence. They have lower ability to buy the food that they need. They're dependent to be fed. And even when everything is given for those of us that are mothers we know without i mean a lot of men are in are not aware of it even when you bring the best food in the house mothers our default is to feed everybody and we eat last this is our default we want every child to grow up everybody to eat the best and we eat the scrum so this is what what, what we do now as Professor Shitu told us, about 570 million women, one in three of women of reproductive age are anemic, just without being pregnant. And you can imagine when you have now the fetus there. We also know that about 38% of women receive, only 38% of women receive the iron and folate that we give routinely and 59 percent of pregnant women attend the four clinical visits of antenatal care while the who even from 2016 has recommended eight even the four is only seen at about 60 percent what about the eight each year about 20 million babies suffer from low birth weight this is an early marker of malnutrition and of course the economic crunch we can't move away from it is increasingly making it very very difficult now the economic consequences of poor nutrition can affect an individual for over 30 years and their families for generation good nutrition is linked to improve school performance increased productivity and also national and community uh, economic growth. Investing in nutrition, the analysis that has been done shows that investing in nutrition could reach up to 5.7 trillion US dollars a year in economic gain by 2030. Meaning that if women and children get good nutrition, the economy of the world will improve by 5.7 seven trillion dollars by 2030 now why as scientists as as clinicians we really want to understand why why mms why the multiple multinutrient 
uh, nutrient uh, supplements. Sometimes MMS is also referred to as prenatal vitamins uh, in some cases, and particularly in developed countries, this is a routine. This is nothing, this is the routine, this is what every pregnant woman does. And for me as a woman, if in the developing countries every woman gets multivitamins, I don't know what is the difference between the pregnancy of a woman here and that of anywhere. At least physiologically, there's no difference. And in terms of needs, our needs are higher. So perhaps for those of us that are women, we might want to also start thinking of innovative ways of ensuring women get this. Could this replace some of the sooner? Could this be a gift for a woman? If you like the baby shower thing, do it in the first three months and get somebody to just get the MMS for you instead of uh, Chiganvi after the baby is born. So what is MMS? And why do we need MMS in Nigeria? As I said, MMN is, MMS is an approach to improving the quality of nutrition care for mothers and preventing low birth weight. It contains 15 multivitamins and minerals, including the iron and folic acid we give routinely. The intervention is proven to be safe, effective, affordable, and cost effective relative to iron and folic acid. And it's recommended for 180 doses to be taken daily. And actually, the bottle comes one, 180 tablets. So in the first visit, a woman gets 180 tablets, finish, no more prescription. You save on paper, which is good for our climate action, because climate change is real. You save on your paper. You save on her time going to the pharmacy. You save her on your time writing and explaining each time. It does, and it empowers the woman to be able to be in control of not only her health, but the health of her baby from day one of her antenatal visit. So what do the evidence show? The evidence have shown, and, I'm, I, and, and I have uh, distributed for you uh, a piece of info. If you look at, at the bottom of that, there's a QR code. There's a QR code. If you scan that QR code with your phone, it will take you to all the evidences. So you will see all the articles in full with all of their references. If you take uh, from the QR code, it will take you to, to, to all that. But the evidence shows that um, reduction in low birth weight and still birth and preterm births as a result of uh, 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 MMS, Populations that will especially benefit are those with high prevalence of anemia or underweight. If you look at those that have had a normal um, uh, uh, nutrition and those that have anemia, those that benefit with anemia outweighs that of those without anemia. And then babies of anemic women receiving MMS and, and folate had reduction in death in the first six months. And these are some of uh, all these statistics are in the documents I've given you. So please take time to read, uh, to read them. Also, MMS, which has, 30 uh, has the same iron and folate as iron and folic acid. In addition, it has all the multivitamins and the minerals uh, that are required. There are no serious side effects. And the impact is similar to just iron and folate because the uh, multivitamins and most of the minerals have very little effect on the gastrointestinal uh, tract. Now, the Lancet had published a dedicated global health, and also within the Cochrane Library, we have more than 15 randomly controlled trials that have been analyzed using different criteria, Two different meta-analyses both confirm that MMS is effective and safe, which is our main concern. Is it effective? Is it safe? So the studies have been done, and I have sent, I've given you the linkages to all the studies that have been done across the world. And countries like Rwanda have seen switched off. There's no iron and folic acid now being served in Rwanda. It's just MMS. And I think Rwanda is one little country that 
we would be co we would be learning a lot from but the beautiful thing about learning from rwanda is that we can actually learn at state level for example we've studied a lot of uh what's happening in rwanda in Borno, from borno state and the population of rwanda is about five mil uh, seven million plus which is just the population of borno state so we're seeing ourselves as little rwanda in nigeria so no wonder you see a lot of things happening in borno uh, there are also uh, uh, studies that have been done in emergency situations uh, for patients with tuberculosis, which is the extreme end, in the, context, uh, in, in the context of also emergencies, emergencies like we have in Borno, uh, human-induced uh, emergencies. And also, importantly, MMS is now in the WHO list of essential medicines. Uh, strong evidence shows MMS improves maternal nutrition and reduces the risk of adverse uh, birth outcomes. And in fact, it has more effect among uh, women with, uh, that have underweight and malnutrition. If you look at, oh, sorry. Now, if you look at the first bar here, Oh, I thought I was uh, technologically savvy. But if you look at the first, the reduce of risk of low birth weight for women with, uh, with, uh, with anemia, it reduces by 19% compared to women with no anemia. So the impact is much higher. And similarly, if you look at it, the risk of stillbirth is also reduced by 21% compared to 8% in women that have no anemia. And also underweight, 16% as compared to 8% and reduced risk of being born small for gestational age, reduced by 8% compared to 3%. So specifically, so it serves not only as preventive prophylaxis, but also as therapeutic. Uh, as I said, of course, there's nothing on earth that has no side effects, uh, but there's nothing that is so different from the use of iron and folic acid because it does contain iron and folic acid. Now, countries can calculate the value of switching from iron to folic acid using a, a cost-benefit tool. You can also have that in the document that I've given you. Uh, but there's no significant, if you look at it in the long run, it's actually cheaper to use, um, uh, to use MMS than iron and folic acid. But what is also happening, and I have my colleague from UNICEF who is going to also show us what UNICEF is trying to do in Nigeria or is doing in Nigeria. They also, we're also working to make sure that it's manufactured in country because anything that's not domesticated has a lot of, uh, uh, impact. Now, transitioning from iron to MMS can avert 7 to 28 million additional infant deaths and disabilities across the 32 low and middle income countries in the world. And scaling up MMS to 90% coverage is projected to contribute to huge human capital gains for all baby, babies born across the 132 low and middle income countries and 5 million additional school years and 18 billion US dollars in cumulative life. The key thing to remember about MMS is it's not just about the mother. It's also about the baby. And it's not just about the health and well-being of the baby. It's about the brain development of the baby. It's about what kind of human being you're going to have roaming down the street. Is it going to be somebody with a low IQ or somebody with a high IQ? These are the kinds of things that we're also looking at. So what is the role of SOGON? What can SOGON do as an organization to ensure that every woman deserves the best that is available out there in the market? I think all doctors and other, we as uh, obstetricians have, and, and healthcare providers have a unique opportunity that only us have, only us God has given that to. That is 
our ability to be able, you know, sometimes to give life and death, actually. Sometimes to give life and death. And we also set standards, knowingly or unknowingly, what your doc doctor tells you becomes almost a norm. So therefore, we do have a responsibility um, how we can ensure that women get the best that is available out there. We also help in shaping standards and practices in Nigeria and West African healthcare policy and practice, ensuring the delivery of standardized and high quality care for women during pregnancy, childbirth, and beyond. This influence can extend to the West whole of West Africa. A lot of members of SOGON are members of the West African College of Surgeons, are practicing along the West African coast and also internationally in Sub-Saharan Africa. We can also, we should also engage in advocacy with private sector for MMS as standard care during pregnancy. Women deserve the best. It's not for us to make an excuse and say she is poor, she can't afford. Let her decide that. Let her decide that, yes, I am poor, I'm choosing not to use this. But give women the option, give women uh, the opportunity to know the best. We could also uh, participate in research, particularly operational research. I personally do not believe in piloting anything in a population of over 200 million. We don't have time for piloting in Nigeria. All we need to do is move on. How many years are we going to keep piloting, piloting, piloting? A country of over 200 million people, you're piloting with 50,000. It's nothing. You're not going to, even if in that scenario you get no maternal mortality. Hey, dear, you haven't changed the statistics. You haven't changed the statistics. Let's get the best practices as it is everywhere in the world. If we need to do research, let's do operational research. At least every research is saving the lives of a woman. Uh, active, we need to actively engage as uh, I personally believe every obstetrician gynecologist is a public health physician. We need to engage policy makers. We need to engage our government at national and at state level to make sure we have policies that ensure that women not only get the best, but they also have a choice to make in their lives. Uh, outreach and creating community awareness. Raising awareness uh, among ourselves, our students. I'm so happy we have, I think, some nursing students. So we ha also have some nurses here. We need to make sure that everybody understands this. Uh, shaping the policies and practices and engaging in uh, advocacy and also ensuring every woman that comes across us has the information. Now, I did say Sogon here. Sogon is a name. Sogon only exists because each one of us because I am a member, because Hadiza is a member, because Nana is a member, because you are a member, because you are a member. If each one of us is not there, there's no Sogon. There's no entity you can hold like this with your finger and say it's Sogon. But you can touch my sister here, and she has a name. And that is why the responsibility is on each one of us. Each one of us swore. Each one of us is an entity in our own right. So the responsibility is, each, is on each one of us. How do we carry our responsibility? How do we ensure that women, every single woman that comes to us as, gets the best? And this responsibility is something that's been lost significantly in medical care across. Sometimes we forget that we are uniquely positioned. In fact, I say that doctors are the people who can go to heaven very easily more than anybody, without question, we go zoom to heaven. Or we can actually zoom to hell, without question also. So, but these are the kinds of things that come with individual responsibilities. So therefore, Nigerian women deserve nothing less than the best. This is the best in the market. Let's put it in front of Nigerian women to make their own decision. Every woman has a right to be actively involved in the delivery of her own health, in the management on her, of her own health, but also in determining the future and the life and health of her unborn baby. And every woman has a right to make informed decision. And the only way a woman can make informed decision is we, each one of us, that's given 
this unique responsibility of being a doctor, a nurse, a healthcare provider in whatever form are able to discharge our responsibility and give information. Finally, as individual obstetricians, gynecologists, I always believe that the ball ends with us. If we do the right things, things will change. If we decide not to do the right thing, things will not change. And ultimately, the future and the life of Nigeria, as we're seeing it now, the future, whether in the next generation of young people that are being born now, we have people with low IQ or high IQ, we have bandits or we have responsible people, we have people that are, that, 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 that are well breastfed and therefore they're calm, or people that are fed like with, with cow milk and therefore they behave like cows, it's all dependent on our individual decisions and how we take our responsibility and how we take our God-given opportunity seriously or lack of seriously. And honestly, we have a lot of people to learn from. We have a lot to learn from. But the bottom line, it doesn't matter how long Dr. Mandara speaks, how long Dr. Galadenchi speaks, how long Dr. Shitu speaks, everything ends with each one of us, whether we take our responsibility seriously or not. On this note, I really want to thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to share some of the things, the work I've been doing. I'm not just special advisor on sustainable development partnerships and humanitarian response in Borno. I still teach obstetrics and gynecology, so I'm proudly an obstetrician still. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mero Mandara. Um, and thank you for you know, delivering it with such passion. I'm not surprised because she's both a successful mother and a successful grandmother. Can we applaud that again? Thank you very much. So you can see why she's advocating it. Some, if I was still bear, bearing children, I'm sure I'll access this for my wife. But it's late now. Yes, thank you very much, grandchildren. I agree with you. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard from a professional colleague. Um, here gathered, we have obstetricians across Nigeria practicing at the highest level. We also have scientists, top level scientists, not only in Nigeria, but at the international realm. A discussion like this will not be complete without hearing from an expert nutritionist. Please, just give me two minutes to give you a slice of the profile of this nutritionist so that when he comes up here you can know decide whether to believe him or not um, the our next speaker is um, dr he will soon come in a minute is dr ehaji is he a senegalese national with over 17 years of experience working in nutrition and public health in a multicultural environment at national, regional, and global levels across Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. His expertise encompasses maternal, infant, and young child nutrition prevention and control of micronutrient deficiencies, community-based management of acute malnutrition, as well as linkages across sectors, including health, agriculture, social protection, water sanitation, and hygiene. Dr. Haji is currently the nutrition manager with UNICEF Nigeria. From 2010 to 2019, prior to 
uh, assuming office in UNICEF Nigeria. He was involved in the regional nutrition specialist. Uh, sorry, he was involved as regional nutrition specialist and managed the implementation of the Africa project titled Assessment and Research on Child Feeding on Availability, Promotion of Foods Consumed by Infants and Young Children with the Helen Keller International based in Dakar, Senegal. And from 2005 to 2009, before joining the HKI, he was one of the nutrition experts that provided technical assistance during the early advantages, sorry, the early stages of the rollout of community-based management of acute malnutrition, as such as um, uh, supported the implementation of government and non-government nutrition programming both developmental and emergency contexts. Dr. Haji uh, has a doctoral degree in food and nutrition from the University of Cheikh Anta Diop of uh, Dakar in 2004. He enjoys reading, playing football, listening to music, and watching movies. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Diop. I am humbled, Professor. Let me make sure that it works first. on right because I would like to point to this this is to move the slide right yeah. okay. right thank you so much uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen good morning good afternoon everyone uh, I'm really very much humbled professor Shitu uh, you really set the scene when it comes to malnutrition especially related to anemia during pregnancy and Dr. Mandara set also the scene related to the evidence we have so far using multiple micronutrient supplement uh, during pregnancy. I would like to start my presentation by quoting what Dr. Mandara said in her last slide, saying that women in Nigeria need not nothing less than the best available evidence. And it is my understanding that the evidence is very strong for the use of multiple micronutrient supplementation because of the current evidence. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I just would like to present this first slide. Uh, it's about showing women at greater risk of facing multiple health and nutrition, dep and nutrition dep deprivations. It's not just nutrition, it's health and nutrition deprivations. And if you look at the figure here, in terms of maternal mortality in Nigeria, 82,000 deaths per year. Neonatal death is around 270,000 a year. If you look at the stillbirth, of one, approximately 181,000 per year. And the percentage of low birth weight is 14 percent but if you look at the figure in the middle it says that approximately 4.6 million pregnant women in nigeria are anemic why is this present is like this because the multiple micronutrient supplementation evidence that dr mandara presented can really help address these deprivations the second one is about the 2021 National Food Consumption and Macronutrient Survey data. We can see that in the middle, 44% 40, pregnant women received at least one HC visit. But if you look at the figure in our left, 
we can really realize that only 34% women receive nutrition and dietary counseling. ANC is a good entry point for providing the essential nutrition counseling in terms of healthy diet, in terms of balanced diet to the pregnant woman. And we often miss that opportunity. Let's look at the figure in the top, top left bottom. 67% pregnant woman had IFA the previous day through Keshonet. Let's look at now the figure in the right. The National Food Consumption and Micronutrient Survey findings show that 14% of pregnant women had malaria, 59% had helicobacter pylori infection, while 5% had helmetic infection. I know that here we are professionals, we know these are combining factors to anemia. So, Anemia among women of reproductive age in, general, in Nigeria remain a severe public health issue. In 2019, Nigeria ranked 16 out of the 10 top countries that have the highest prevalence of anemia among women of reproductive age. Nigeria follows only five countries are doing are poor, are doing poor, are have poor data than Nigeria, which are Yemen, India, Maldives, Mali, and Benin. But now let's look at the figure in my right, the trend from 20 to 2020. If you look at the anemia rate, in 20, the anemia rate among women of reproductive age was 58.8. In 2020, maybe you will be surprised, it's 50. It means that over 20 years period, look at the three, only 3.8 point percentage reduction. This is really, really, really slow. And if Nigeria has to meet the WHE and SDG target for anemia, a corrected effort with new strategies is required. If you look at the dotted line here, in the National Food and Nutrition Policy 2016 target is 40 and we are still over 50%. And the SDG, which is coming in eight years period, is 27 only. It means that there is a long way to go. Again, approximately 4.6 million pregnant women are estimated to be anemic. Dr. Mandara elaborated too much on micro, multiple micronutrient supplements during pregnancy, but I would also would like just to to highlight in the slide the fact that we all know that women lack access to essential vitamins and minerals such as iron, zinc, iodine, but also folic acid due to poor diet. We also know that women usually start their pregnancy with absence or marginal physical store, iron stores, which likely expose them to anemia during pregnancy. And let's also factor in the compound factor by frequent frequent infections, malaria, soil infestations. Combining multiple micronutrient supp supplement in single provides several benefits and has several and can address several deficiencies at the same time. Provision of each m nutrient including during pregnancy is operationally and economically not feasible at scale. We all know that. As I said, MMS is a low cost innovation containing 15 vitamins and minerals and can address most of the deficiencies. So this table compare MMS to IFA, MMS in our right hand and IFA in the, uh, MMS in the left, IFA in the right hand. So I would just like to say that MMS contains 15 vitamins and minerals including iron. Iron and folic acid contains iron Iron, iron and folic acid only. The intervention, as he said, is safe, is effective, affordable and cost effective. And, and cost effective. The recommended dose is the same as iron folic acid, 180 doses to be taken daily during pregnancy and to be started as soon as possible. But the added value, the comparative advantage is that compared to IFA, uh, MMS has significantly effective 
in reducing the risk of low birth weight, the small for gestational age, preterm birth, but also reduction of neonatal and infant mortality. Let me skip this one. So, MMS could be seen as a social equalizer. In developing countries are using multiple micronutrients during pregnancy. Why we are not, why Nigeria women couldn't deserve that? That's a, the question that Dr. Mandara raised. And this is a good opportunity for now, for Nigeria also, to have the standard of care for our pregnant women with, uh, with uh, anemia. So, the role of UNICEF, UNICEF effort for MMS in Nigeria, we look at it at different levels. At policy level, at policy level, we support the government to the government to ensure MMS is included into policies and strategies, but also in terms of formulation on the standardization of formulation and regulations. We also would like to continue the advocacy with the government of Nigeria for adoption of MMS as a standard of care during pregnancy. We are also working with the EML scientific committee to include MMS in the essential nutrition list. Financing is critical, advocacy is important, budget is important for procurement or delivery of MMS, but UNICEF has put in place already a child nutrition grant that all state can, 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 can leverage on. If a state, let's say, if a state provided one dollar, UNICEF will, meet it, uh, will match it with another dollar for procurement of those commodities. We look at it also at the supply side. We know that given the need, we are talking about 4.6 million, but the total pregnant women in Nigeria is 7.8, which is very big, which is much bigger than the population in Rwanda that Dr. Mandara shows. So, so it means that there is an opportunity, a big market opportunity for local production, but need also to, to work on the forecast MMS demand. In terms of delivery, UNICEF is working to introduce MMS as a standard of care in, three, in five states for three years. The state Kaduna, Bauchi, Kano, Lagos, and Imo states. Delivery is also important. Capacity building is important at all levels on maternal nutrition and MMS. Logistic management will play a critical role. A BCC strategy is important since it's the best way for women to initiate and uptake an adhere to MMS, but also strengthening the data system tracking. So should Nigeria transition from IFS to MMS for antenatal programming? I will not elaborate too much here. It has already been covered by Dr. Mandera. We can look it at policy support level. The policy is clear. It, it is part of the WHO NAC guideline. The evidence is very strong, and the cost effectiveness also is absolutely very strong. Transitioning from IFA to MMS will, rever will revert an additional 5,700 5, uh, 5, disability adjusted life years. It will save lives. It is very cost effective. So I will stop there, Professor. Thank you so much for your attention. I think Dr. Haiji deserves another round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, it's always good and gladdening to hear from an expert. You see how he took us through the granular details. And, uh, you know, this complemented with the documents we have. Nobody here is likely to forget these details. And... Um, you know, now we'll go to the last segment of our presentation. Um, we have had, we were introduced to the, to the topic. We have had an obstetrician's perspective. We've also heard from an expert nutritionist. The question is what next? Yes. What should we do with this information we have heard? Is it just for our consumption as individuals? What should we do? What, in other words, what are the next steps? I know the two presenters, you know, alluded to part of, you know, tried to respond to this. 
but we want a more precise description of what we should do next because this good news should be taken to certain destinations certain targets how will they get there where will the action recommended action be taken because we here gathered are what we are going to serve as can do, uh, you know conduits you know to ensure that this information shared with us does not stop with us it is rippled on to get to the correct destination and the person to do this is one of the most prominent national figures present in this room he is the highly respected obstetrician in fact he was uh, a one time treasurer the council member and what more is even one of the is is uh, giving leadership to nigerian response to the unacceptable scourge of gynecologic cancers and wait for this is the pioneer vice chancellor of the federal university of health sciences azari please i want you to join me to welcome professor bala audi he'll be taking us to the next steps what should we do with all this information at our doorsteps professor audi please thank you very much uh, my teachers here my colleagues i think mine is a very straightforward presentation it's an advocacy and i will start from the end of the presentations of all the speakers which is essentially nigerian women deserve the best what is the best we have seen very clear evidence that we have been using so far iron and folic acid as prophylaxis during pregnancy for our women but there is clear evidence that if we utilize multiple micronutrient supplements there are added advantages on and above using iron and folic acid alone which are also anyway contained in these 15 vitamins and minerals that are inside mss the beauty of it also is that it is taken as one single medication daily that you can prescribe once at the first visit that the woman can take through pregnancy and the period for a period of 180 days it makes life simpler more effective for both healthcare provider as well as for the mother and the outcome of that pregnancy beyond that we have seen enough evidence scientifically proven to such an extent that this evidence has made the world health organization to include mm mms in the essential medical list but is this in our national essential medical list this is where the advocacy comes but beyond putting it in our national essential medical list i am here you are here we are all here as leaders of thought as well as implementation science as well as advocacy for women's health 
in this country that Sogon champions. We can change and transit from this practice of using iron and folic acid only to using MMS from our own daily, day-to-day -day practices. But beyond that, in this forum, we also constitute leaders of thought and provision of scientific evidence of the value of the things we do in maternal and child health care. We have these evidences, which means we can also formulate what is required for implementation in our own departments of obstetrics and gynecology through our antenatal care period and even across pediatrics. The evidence is very clear that MMS produce significant benefit in reducing significantly stillbirth, small for gestational age, low birth weight, and even perinatal mortality for those who have used these drugs in their, uh, in their um, in the outcome of the pregnancies where these medications were used. And taking it during adolescent period, and that is where the statistics come of saving as much as or improving the world economy to as much as $5.7 trillion. When we use this even through preschool age, the prepubertal, the non-pregnant, the pregnant, and the puparium, because of the added benefits of overall health of the individual and the capacity of such an individual to become a more useful member of society. Colleagues, senior colleagues here, ladies and gentlemen, it starts from this room here with us. We need to transit this practice on our own to move from iron and folic acid to multi-nutrient supplements. But essentially also to carry it beyond our own individual practices to our departmental policies, to our institutional policies, and to national policy. I'm sure Sogong will take this up in trying to make sure that it develops a guideline that utilizes MMS across this spectrum of care and development as well as advocacy to ensure that it is included in the national essential medical list. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Audu. Um, there's, no way, there's no need actually to summarize what you have said so succinctly and comprehensively. Thank you very much. Um, we are hoping, you know, I just want to remind us. I hope we know, because I know in, in Sogon we are all ethically compliant. Uh, but just a reminder that you see, in a situation where there is scientific evidence that an intervention is superior to what you are doing, it becomes unethical if you don't avail your clients or your patients with them. This morning we heard about the emotive package. We heard about the non-pneumatic uh, uh, anti-shock garment. Now we are hearing what? MMS. I sincerely hope that by this time next year, when we are having the next Sogon, we will be treated to what? Change in practices. That, are adopted, that have adopted what? These best practices. So thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Audu, and uh, 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 Professor, I think we should be calling Professor Mandara Professor now. Yeah, she deserves that. And Professor Haji. Yes, thank you very much for your illuminating presentations. Uh, please, we'll just take three comments or questions, but please, they need to be brief. Questions or comments, I'll give you numbers. 
That's one, two, three, after which no more numbers. Is your hand up? Yes, number one, number two, number three. Yes, please. Please, who is our number one, please? I think Thank our speakers will note any questions yes, and respond um, at the end. Thank you so much. And I want to appreciate the speakers. Uh, my name is Dr. Bukola Adeshino. Um, I think you're actually preaching to the converted. The average obstetrician wants what is best for their patients. So if anything that will be good for our patients, we are on board with you. But I, I just have two questions. The first is um, the constituents. You know what I'm asking? The patients always come into clinic and then they're telling you, hey, doctor, I'm using this, doctor, I'm using that. And you want to be sure that what they are asking you or what they are showing you is in line with what we want them to use. So is it that the, um, we're going to have a particular package? Because you know, like I think Dr. Haji said, we have a large population. The next thing is everybody is going to get on board. People are going to be importing, people are going to be manufacturing, people, you're going to, the market is going to get flooded. And we want to be sure that what we are showing or what we are telling the women to use is what we really want them to use. And I'm glad somebody mentioned regulation because I think that is also going to be important and that is something that we also need to take into consideration. But one thing that I haven't heard, and again, the average obstetrician will always be concerned about that. How much is it going to cost? Please don't get me wrong. Nothing good comes easy. And health is really not cheap. It is not free. It is not cheap. You know, if you want something good. So, but I think it is also good that we get an idea of how much this thing. Or, and then is it going to come in a package from the government and is that what you're going to do? But of course, I don't think that that's what, because I'm sure we want the private sector on board as well. So that it will be able to get to all the crannies and access will be easy. So thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. Number two, please. Uh, thank you very much for the pre beautiful presentations. My name is Dr. Abdullahi Muhammad Kabir from Abu Bakr Tapawale University Teaching Hospital, Bauchi. Um, the various presenters have presented with evidence and uh, for us once there is evidence we don't have a choice but to practice what the evidence has said but one question that has kept on coming to me is the fact that the MMS contain 30 milligram of elemental ion compared to 60 milligram in the uh, uh, ferrous sulfate that we mostly prescribe to our patient. And we know that only about 10% of that is absorbed. And we know the iron requirement in pregnancy is between that 3 milligram to up to 5.5 milligram in advanced uh, pregnancy. So now, the question I ask myself always is that does that 30 milligram supply the needed requirement especially that the fact that we know that most of our women that get into pregnancy are in iron deficit so should we still believe that that 30 milligram that is in the MMS is enough to cut out for the iron requirement in pregnancy that's the first question and then again we also know that there is also increased oxidative stress that is caused by iron, especially in the first trimester. I want to believe that the MMS is recommended to be used from the beginning of pregnancy to the end of pregnancy. Or do we exclude the use of it in the first trimester? Looking at the fact that iron causes an increase in oxidative stress uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Three, please. Please, 
Uh, good morning and thank you presenters and senior colleagues. My name is Dr. Emmanuel Ogwa. I practice at the FMC Brennan Kudu. I, I, very interesting presentation and of course uh, the evidence is around the use of MMS. It's very, very great and encouraging. But I also want us to realize that uh, for those of us who practice in rural communities, um, of course, if you practice in the city, you see a lot of women coming to tell you they take things like pregnant care. They want to take pregnant care. You know, it's like a class. Yeah, so the same people probably understand when you talk about MMS and they could buy the idea. But in situation where you practice in the villages or the remote areas of the country, uh, the message may be a very difficult one. So we need to work very, very hard to be able to uh, pass that message across. But something always comes to mind. Can we think about ways of at least in the woman's iron or nutrition level pre-pregnancy improved? Because many of them come into pregnancy with a background anemia, for example. So I begin to think that we have like local sources, for example, which we could also advise that even before they are pregnant, these things could help to improve their nutrition or their their blood levels what simply comes to my mind is a particular leaf we call zegele in this part of the country uh, moringa precisely so um, evidences have also shown it has it's very very strong in micronutrients very strong in iron and so on and so forth is there any way we can encourage women at least in those remotest part of the country to see how this can be part of their normal regular nutrition even before they got pregnant so because we know if that happens i tried to do that by producing a juice with moringa but i also discovered that that's expensive so we can't really sell that to the women so but the leaf itself is there any way we can encourage them to use this to build their nutrition even pre-pregnancy because now when they are pregnant it becomes easier to maintain them advert that uh, good level of uh, nutrient thank you thank you very much Please, I crave your indulgence. I said three comments, isn't it? Please, permit me to make it four. I'll tell you why. Because I cannot say no to my vice chancellor. He wants to contribute to this discourse. Uh, my vice chancellor, Federal University of Health Sciences, Otuko, that's the premier Federal uh, University of Health Sciences, uh, Professor I A O Uja O O N. Thank you very much, Professor Shitu. Well, with Shitu, I'm very comfortable any day, any time, because we grew up together in Zaria. Um, I'm happy to have this cream of um, speakers. I, I told uh, Mandara that it's an orator and it's, uh, it's a community mobilizer and he's done that over the years. Um, this is a very good topic and uh, to the gynecologists it, should be not, it shouldn't be a problem. However, to the community it will be a problem. And you all know that everybody now has Android phone. When you see, I've just uh, gone to my Google and say, hey, what is MSS? It's already there. And uh, we need to know why we are transiting from our folic acid and phosphate to this one. You must convince people because they will come and tell you what is it that is in this place that you want us to move to that place. It, takes you, it must take you some time. To, to, to convince them. Because Nigeria is not as illiterate as we think. So we, we need to do that. We need to be able to. And it's also true that the fact that there are so many evidence based from Europe and America that we should necessarily accept it. I say so because we must have an indigenous study. It doesn't matter whether it corroborates. And if it corroborates, it strengthens your, ha your hand. I remember in the 90s, when Augmentin was brought to Joss, 
And they say he's already done, the uh, study has been done in, in Lagos, Ibadan. I say Ibadan, in Lagos. Just is not Ibadan, Lagos. And that if you don't bring it here, we are not going to use it. So they brought and we did our study. And we came, I mean, where is uh, Sikra? Sikra here. Sikra, uh, Sikra is there. Kilani. Uh -huh. She is in the model now. So we. So we did our own study and we came with our own findings. Because we are not just uh, consumers, we also have to have evidence. And therefore, what I'm asking uh, of, uh, of uh, Mero Mandara is that we should have areas where it's not pilot. It can just, you can just give and then document and get the, the findings. That is uh, implementation research. Because it works. And the country is so large, there are so many countries in Nigeria. Yeah, because we have to study what happens in Niger Delta, and what happens in the Sahel, what happens in Sudan Savannah, what happens in Guinea Savannah. Yes, no, we cannot devoid that. So we need to do that. Thirdly, I had worked in UNICEF, and when there was this study, this uh, mobilization for malaria and pregnancy, they say teaching hospitals are not uh, to be involved. I say, no, that's not correct. These are people who are going to teach those who are going to work in the community, the medical students. And when I went back, well, even though they say they are doing in primary health care, I say, no, my own, I will do in the teaching hospitals also. And I did in the University of Joss. The reason is that the multiplier effect is so much. You are teaching nursing students, you are teaching medical students, and these are people who go to the community later, even NYSC. And then you say you are going to primary health care where probably you have nobody or maybe two or something. So I want to use this opportunity to let the development partners use where you can produce evidence for national planning. That is my message and that's my request. Thank you very much. I think very quickly our speakers will just respond to the questions raised. And I think I'll start with uh, Professor Dr. Mandara. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, starting with Professor MNI, sir. No, you're the pioneer. Uh -huh. At that time, we only knew one MNI, and there's still one MNI. Uh, looking at the, the, what you discuss about research, I truly agree with you. There needs to be research. Uh, but what we're advocating for, sir, is operational research. We don't wait. Yes, and as UNICEF is um, rolling out and working with the federal government to roll out some of the MMS interventions next year, we will be working with some institutions uh, to do operational research. And already we're discussing with uh, the Federal University of Health Sciences in Azare to see how we can do that. And Oturposa, thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, in terms of uh, a commencement of um, uh, MMS, yes, first trimester, and I agree with you the concern about the percentage that's being absorbed. As you said, three to five of 10% is about three milligram. The studies have shown that consistently, if you take it over time, it does correct uh, what is required. So the formulation of the MMS, which has, uh, somebody actually asked uh, that, what's unique, the, uh, and uh, my sister there asked about the quantity. All this data, actually, if you look at, I hope everybody has a copy of this. There's a QR code here at the bottom. Just put your camera on the QR code and then take the QR code. It will lead you to all the researches that are available and you'll see most of these. Please take time to answer. As uh, Prof uh, said, everybody now has Google to ask. So we need to be on top of the game. So what is unique? Vitamin A, vitamin D. And it's better than most of the, uh, the fashionable pregnancy care formulations because those were formulated based on various needs but this was a study by the united by who bringing all the experts together to actually create this unique formula now the formula 
the formula is now available. So it's not, it's not a trademark. It's not going to be patented. Uh, every credible organization can produce, provided they get a UNICEF certification and the um, NAFDAQ certification. And at the moment, even before rollout, in order to bring price down, there's discussion with manufacturers. So that as we roll out, it is available in Nigeria. It is manufactured. And I think the timeline is two years now that they're hoping to manufacture. Zogale, excellent, excellent idea. And I think this doesn't need permission. We just go and do it. But I can tell you as a Zogale eater, since my childhood, it's not everybody that has a taste for Zogale. You have to be a local of some far northern Nigeria to have acquired the taste. It's like me on Kuka. Some people who still say, yuck. I mean, it's something I'll eat 10 times a day. So it's something that we acquire. If there was a tablet, that would be good. But there's no tablet. But it's a it's, it's fantastic meal for those of us that grew it. How we're going to do it, it's up to us. Particularly for those in the north of Nigeria, there's just no reason not to eat Zogale, honestly. And a host of, uh, of other things. I think uh, he would... Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Zogolo, does that mean Morenga? <laughs> I was trying to follow. That, that's a very good question. I, I think we, we, we need to keep in, keep in mind that MMS should be channeled through internetal system and counseling to mothers in general for a healthy diet is absolutely important. And no matter where you are located, having the locally available known ingredients that have high level of iron. Morenga is known for that. So I think there is nothing, there is no arm for that. It, acha. Acha, what is Acha? Just say they know. Okay, and, and Acha. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, and definitely another critical issue is the diet of the pregnant woman is important. Having animal source protein is important having vita, uh, vegetables is important, having fruits is important. All of those need to be packaged. This is a supplement, but it just comes to complement all those things. I think that's very important to say. The second question is the first one that Dr. You raised related to the cost of MMS. MMS, the dose of 180 doses we take for, for six months. It costs $3.96 which is 3,200 Naira only. Very for cheap. Whole pregnancy. For whole pregnancy. For whole pregnancy. 3,200 Naira. For the whole pregnancy. For the whole pregnancy. While IFA is 2,200, there is 1,000 difference. But in terms of the benefit, uh, MMS out, outweighs IFA. I like the point you mentioned on regulation. It's absolutely important. Our supply division has started the consultation, industry cons industrial consultations in Lagos two weeks ago, so that to map out the different pharmacy bodies that can really produce MMS, having the capacity, but producing locally, definitely. The process has gone, we did a mapping already. So now the next stage is for the, to review and give them the specification, as doctor mentioned, we are using the United national international multiple micronutrient antenatal preparation which is called unimap there is another preparation calls developed by the u.s people uh, through the institute of uh, of, uh, of medicine but for the sake of this we are using the unimap formulation that formulation need to be standard that formulation need to be regulated because we need a quality of product at any point of time so Again, I, m I mentioned during my presentation that annually in Nigeria, we are estimating 7.8 pregnancies, 7.8 million pregnancies. That's a very huge number, meaning that the cost, when we start going on scale, will drastically go down. So I think there is opportunity really, really to transition to MMS. Thank you so much. Over. Well, I guess there isn't really much to add. We very much agree with Professor Uja's um, position that as we roll out, we also conduct operational research. And probably as we're doing that, even before using the MMS, because there's clear evidence and we need also to document that, that 
at least up to 50 to 70 percent in some population of women will be having one, three or six micronutrient deficiency already. So even the risk of any hypervitaminosis is actually almost ruled out. Okay? And then the iron dose, if you look at the iron dose, that's what is supposed to be standard. Most of the time when we're using iron and folic acid alone, actually we're giving in excess. But remember also this formulation has vitamin C, which will improve your iron absorption. And remember anyway, because of the mucosal block theory, no matter how much iron you take, you can only absorb a certain percentage. So there's no point overflowing. Okay? Thank you. Um, 3,200 Naira to be used throughout pregnancy. I've never been pregnant <laughs> because I'm a man. But I want to tell you, I've been using Centrum. I don't know how many of you know Centrum. A to Z for the past 15 years. E yes. I use every day before I sleep. I take a tablet of it. I don't experience anemia. And for people who know me, I'm not lazy or weak. So I can imagine if pregnant women were using something like that. So uh, I think the speakers have treated this very well, my own view. And please, this is an appeal. You know, these days it's customary to find people going on outreaches to the rural areas, you know, promising surgical whatever. Even doing hernia where there's no hernia or where it doesn't require surgical intervention. Please include MMS. Target pregnant women in those target communities. Go there and give them just 3,200 pregnant women. Their children and their next generation will forever be grateful to you. So on this note, I want to thank our experts. Uh, UNICEF, uh, uh, Girl Concerns, and Sogon for facilitating this. And of course, our local organizing committee for tolerating the slight encroachment in time. Thank you very much.